right now. We are several days into the fall season and those temperatures are finally making their way to South Texas. Yeah, despite that, many here in South Texas saw triple digit heat today, but meteorologist Katie Blake says relief is definitely on the way. Katie, what can we expect to see for the rest of the week as the cold front finally comes through? Oh my gosh, we're going to have a beautiful stretch of weather this week. The tricky day that is going to be tomorrow because that's when the front's going to move through and that's when we'll see some big changes to our weather. The biggest issue I think for you on Monday is going to be the wind. Take a look at temperatures across the state. They're in the 50s in the Panhandle, 62 in Lubbock. They were in the 90s this afternoon, 68 in Abilene, still in the 80s in Dallas. So that front is starting to work through uh, North Texas. It's almost to San Angelo and overnight tonight that front will swing through. It'll sweep all the way across South Texas during the day tomorrow, bringing us some cooler and drier air. But again, I think what's really going to get your attention tomorrow is the wind. Wind advisory is out. We're going to have some big time wind gusts tomorrow. We'll talk more about this and what your week ahead looks like coming up in just a little bit. Tim. Thank you, Katie. Mental health issues are mounting in the wake of COVID-19, making it a priority discussion nationwide. Some racial groups are historically hesitant to seek help. A local psychologist tells me the stigma of mental illness and seeking counseling is prevalent in the black community. She says, although this is slowly getting better, the barriers are rooted in historical structural racism. Dr. Ebony Jackson breaking the stigma of mental health care in the black community comes from a very personal place. Many therapists and psychologists such as myself got into this field because we want, you know, people who look like us to know that it's OK to come get help. And those people may feel more comfortable seeing someone who looks like them. A licensed psychologist here in San Antonio, Dr. Jackson wrote her whole dissertation on the subject. Jackson says these barriers originate from institutional racism throughout history. Thinking about the Tuskegee syphilis studies that they did um, over decades. From 1932 to 1972, the United States Public Health Service and Tuskegee University conducted the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, an experiment following the natural progression of untreated syphilis. The impoverished black men used in the study were oblivious, only told they were receiving free health care. Overall, that helped kind of feed the mistrust of the medical community and then branches out to like the mental health community. Dr. Jackson said the stigma has also stemmed from underrepresentation of black psychologists in the field. She said other races saw therapy as something white people did. About the 1960s and 70s along right along with the civil rights movement, you saw this influx of like black psychologists and therapists coming about. They didn't feel represented within the general population of the American Psychological Association, and so they established their own association, the um, ABCI. Paving the way for open conversation and comfort in the black community to seek help from doctors who understood them and their struggles. And that continues today. There's a, a whole community of groups on social media, especially Facebook, of like black clinicians or for other clinicians of color who are coming together to get um, information out there to our communities. She hopes the stigma will continue to fade, especially as communities nationwide reconcile with African-American history and take major steps towards a healthier future for all. This is one of many stories we're doing as part of our new series, Voices of a Nation. To see more of our work, including segments on Black-owned businesses, go to ksat.com slash voices. Turning to the coronavirus now, here's a look at the latest local COVID-19 numbers here in Bear County. It has been more than two weeks since we saw new cases dip below 100, but that's what we are seeing tonight with Metro Health reporting only 56 new cases. The total confirmed cases now sits at 57,145 since all this began. The seven day moving average now at 162 cases per 24 hours. As for the deaths in the community, three new deaths to report tonight and 53 from backlog dates ranging from June 29th to September 10th. The death toll is now at 1,130. As for the hospitalization rate, a slight uptick, 221 people remain in the hospital with 86 in the ICU and 34 on ventilators. A developing story we're following for you tonight. Former campaign manager for President Donald Trump, Brad Parscale, was reportedly armed with a gun and threatening to harm himself in his Fort Lauderdale home today. According to our sister station in Miami, Parscale's wife called police saying he was armed and had access to multiple firearms inside the home and was threatening to harm himself. Officers eventually got into the home and transported him to a nearby hospital for evaluation. 
Parscale, a former San Antonian and a Trinity University graduate, began working for the Trump campaign during the 2016 campaign, launching the official website for the campaign and also handling social media efforts as the campaign's digital director. His digital efforts were widely credited with helping Trump get elected. Parscale was named campaign manager for the president's re-election bid, but was demoted from that position in July of this year. A statement from President Trump's campaign tonight, the communication director says in part, Brad Parscale is a member of our family and we all love him. We are ready to support him and his family in any way possible, end quote. New tonight, a San Antonio police sergeant is now in custody and facing a DWI charge. Sergeant Glenn McCulloch was arrested today in the 21,000 block of Blanco Road. According to Police Chief William McManus, he's been with the department for 29 years. He'll be placed on administrative leave pending the results of the criminal investigation. In other news, a woman was taken to the hospital after being stabbed on the Riverwalk last night. She's recovering from her injury, but residents are a bit uneasy after learning that crime happened in a place they consider to be safe. The night team's Jaffney Gray has the reaction from people strolling the Riverwalk today. Maybe there's people who are t too loud or teenagers who may be acting like fools, but nothing violent. Several people say they feel mostly safe when spending time walking along the Riverwalk, like Michelle Nolan, who says just last night she was riding her bike with her friend. Everything was fine. We didn't run into any trouble and I feel very safe for the most part. It was a shock to them after hearing just after midnight, a woman and her boyfriend were walking in the area when another man came up to them, pulled a knife out and stabbed the woman in the arm. That's crazy. Like, I'm, <laughs> I don't even know. Are you at all worried a little bit now? Oh, definitely. Fortunately, the woman only suffered non-life-threatening injuries. She was still hurt with her significant other, and I can just imagine how he's feeling too. Like, he wishes he probably could have done more, but I guess that just proves that no matter who you're with, you should always just be careful because no one cares out there sometimes. The people we spoke to say it's frustrating someone took advantage of a nice place only to commit a senseless crime. Nowhere in Texas you can get this kind of experience, which is the reason why people want to come here. And if they hear like things like this going on, they are definitely going to be scared because it's a family place. Those along the river walk tonight encourage everyone to be extra aware of their surroundings. You never know if you're going to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. That happens all the time, no matter where you are or who you are. Hopefully we can keep all the riffraff out, you know? Now, after the stabbing, the girl's boyfriend did get into a physical altercation with that suspect before the suspect ran off, which is why San Antonio police need your help. If you have any information that can help lead to his arrest, call them immediately. Live at the Riverwalk, Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. We now know the name of the man killed in a head-on crash with a VIA bus this morning. The Bear County Medical Examiner identified him as 29-year-old Jasper Richardson. The crash happened in the 5700 block of Foster Road near Seguin Road. Police say Richardson's vehicle drifted into oncoming bus lanes and into a VIA bus. The bus driver tried to avoid the crash veering right and jumping a curb. Richardson was pronounced dead at the scene. The bus driver and passengers were not hurt. A woman is in police custody following a fatal crash in Leon Valley last night. Rebecca DeLeon now charged with intoxication manslaughter. That crash happened just before midnight on Wurzbach Road. Police say DeLeon was traveling northbound when she lost control of her vehicle. Police say she went over the sidewalk and that's when she hit the pedestrian and slammed into a tree in the parking lot of a Wells Fargo. The victim was pronounced dead at the scene. They have not yet been identified. An argument between a couple led to a woman being shot on the south side today. The shooting happened in the 10,000 block of Riadosa Street. San Antonio police say the man threatened the woman with a gun. The woman's son stepped in and began wrestling with the man, and police say the gun went off, hitting the woman in the thigh. She was taken to Bamsi, and her condition is unknown at this time. It's unclear if charges will be filed. A right and a responsibility. Officials with the Dream Big Scholarship Fund say completing the U.S. Census has never been more important. Tonight, the organization held an event at the AT&T Center. The night team, Stephen Cavazos, with why some are saying 2020 is the most crucial year to be counted. We want to make sure that we have all of our people counted for it. Carmen and Griselda Gauthier say the U.S. Census helps the foundation the community is built on. We want to make sure our children have 
the best opportunity and have, you know, the most resources. Counting for the census began in March, but efforts to get residents counted are still happening. The Dream Big Scholarship Fund held a drive through movie style comedy show at the AT&T Center, complete with food trucks, love you entertainment, and census staff. It'll be a great way to let people come out as well as get the census done. B. Michelle, the co-founder of the Dream Big Scholarship Fund, says the community should know the census is important. A lot of funding that the city received, and every city actually, is tied to the census. The census, which is conducted every 10 years, counts every resident in the country. The data affects the number of seats each state has in the U.S. House of Representatives, along with state and federal funding. Census staff went from vehicle to vehicle, asking residents if they've been counted. Those who already filled out the form understand the weight it carries. It's more important for our black and brown individuals because, again, we get left out, you know, and people don't often see us as an equal, and we are. She believes it's just one step in creating a better community. And if we count ourselves, you know, in the census, a lot of open the doors for us to be able to do that. Now, the Dream Big Scholarship Fund says that their goal is to get 100 households to complete the census, and they say that they're well on their way to completing that goal. Now, the deadline to, to complete the census, that is, was scheduled for September 30th. However, that deadline has been extended to October 31st. We're live tonight outside the AT&T Center. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. Tim Courtney. Protests continue over the weekend for the police shooting death of Breonna Taylor in Louisville. Why her family has filed a motion to get the grand jury transcript. And it's a program aimed at helping families recovering from addiction. We speak to the founder who says creating the Comfort Cafe was a personal goal of hers. It's this week's What's Up South Texas segment. And up next, a tentative timeline now underway for the Senate confirmation hearing for the open Supreme Court seat after the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What we can expect in the coming day. If an Xbox Series X or a PlayStation 5 is on your Christmas list, and it's right around the corner, you may not know which console is a better deal or even what your kids are talking about. Tomorrow on Good Morning San Antonio, we'll compare the new systems, the prices, and whether or not they are worth your money. Well, he has made his pick and he's made it clear President Trump wants to see Amy Coney Barrett confirmed to the Supreme Court before the new election. But that's less than 40 days away. So what would a fast tracked confirmation look like? Brett Conway breaks down the timeline. It is my honor to nominate one of our nation's most brilliant and gifted legal minds to the Supreme Court. Judge Amy Coney Barrett, There's President Trump's pick children. for Supreme Court Justice, and the push for confirmation is well underway. Uh, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows says it starts with getting senators on board. And making sure that all the senators are well informed of uh, the judge's credentials, which are impeccable, uh, but we're, we're optimistic that we'll be prepared. He says they plan to start making their case to senators Monday and be on Capitol Hill as early as Tuesday. Barrett will also be there Tuesday to meet with several people, including Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Then the process heads to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator Lindsey Graham, head of that committee, says the confirmation hearing will begin starting with opening statements on October 12th. On Tuesday and Wednesday, Judge Barrett will be questioned. Then there would be a closed session on October 15th with outside witnesses. And finally, a committee vote on October 22nd to send the nomination before the entire chamber. And Senator Graham says he hopes it'll clear the committee by the 26th. Then it will be up to Senator McConnell as to what to do with the, the nomination once it comes out of committee. This timeline tees up a final vote on the Senate floor just days shy of the November 3rd election, putting the Senate on track for one of the quickest confirmations in modern history. I'm Britt Conway reporting. And just a quick history note, uh, no Supreme Court nominee has ever been confirmed after the month of July during a presidential election year. All right, a look outside with live cam, 84 degrees here. It is muggy out there. It was a little humid yesterday, but you really, really felt the humidity today.
Uh, and some folks across South Texas did see temperatures in the triple digits this afternoon. That is really hard to believe. Hot and sticky. It's the yes. price we have to pay to get the cold front. And I'm going to give you all the credit because you did your rooftop weather on Friday <laughs> and you brought out the, the jack-o'-lantern face and did yeah. the dance. So it's all on her. Yay, Katie, good job. <laughs> yes, per, yes, I, I was hurrying it along, just, you know, yes. cheering it on so that it would get here. Uh, yes, front is working through Texas, and this means big changes for us as we start the new week. So today, our high temperature in San Antonio, 93. The ACs were going, plenty of sunshine, but look at our changes tomorrow. Monday afternoon, we're looking at a forecast high around 77. Some additional clouds and feeling a whole lot more like fall tomorrow as compared to today. Look at the high temperatures, 100 100 in Catula, 101 in Del Rio. Del Rio, your old record high for today was 104. You got awfully close to that and just all across the board, plenty of humidity. We were pulling some big time heat index readings this afternoon, which is just not cool for late September. Uh, but look at high temperatures elsewhere across the state in the 90s from Lubbock to Wichita Falls, but the high temperature in Amarillo only 77 because that frontal boundary snuck through early enough in the day that it really limited their temperatures. But you saw Lubbock was in the 90s. Now they're 30 degrees cooler in the 60s. So that front is putting in some work and dropping temperatures across the state. Even Midland was just at 81. Now they're down to 76. So their temperature is starting to fall. But I want to zoom in a little bit closer here because the frontal boundary itself is marked by a change in wind direction. That's actually happening as far south as San Angelo. San Angelo is about to pull in a north wind, so that frontal boundary is dropping down closer to the Concho Valley, but you'll notice the temperature drop is lagging a bit behind the actual frontal boundary itself. That trend will continue, but uh, that cooler and drier air is there. Look at these dew points up into Lubbock and Amarillo, 30s and 40s. All of this cooler and drier is going to be dropping south tonight and during the day tomorrow that will filter into our area here in South Texas. Take a look at our dew points this week. Nothing in the 60s. That is some good news. We're going to get some very dry air settling in, especially through the middle portion of the week. Our dew points will be in the 30s and 40s. So that's what just kicks the humidity out of the air. That's what allows our temperatures to bottom out more at night but then also heat up a bit more efficiently in the afternoon. So tomorrow, temperatures limited to the 70s in the afternoons, but as you look toward the rest of the week, 88 Wednesday afternoon, 89 on Thursday. Yes, that is warm, but it's going to be comfortable because of that dry air settling in this week. So really looking beautiful as we get into uh, the middle of this week here, but it's tomorrow that's going to be our kind of uh, transition day, the day that things start to change. And I think the biggest issue tomorrow is going to be wind rain, not really in the cards. I can't rule out a brief little shower, especially east of 35 very, very early tomorrow morning as this frontal boundary is moving through, but we're just not um, sitting in the good rain making energy as far as this frontal boundary is concerned. During the day tomorrow, we'll also clear out cloud cover wise from north to south. So by tomorrow evening, uh, pretty clear up in the hill country. If you're south of Highway 90, it'll take a bit longer to clear out tomorrow, but generally speaking, clearing from north to south. Now again, the wind, I think that's going to be the bigger issue tonight. Winds will start to kick in right away when the frontal boundary moves through. So even overnight up in the hill country, your winds will start to jump up to between 15 and 25 miles per hour. Uh, breezy winds will settle in elsewhere across the area during the day on Monday, and it's going to stay breezy all day. However, the highest wind gusts should come during the first part of the day tomorrow. So a wind advisory is in place. This is for wind gusts up to 40, 45 miles per hour. That is expected generally along and north of the Highway 90 corridor. So definitely gusty first part of the day tomorrow. Keep that in mind. As far as temperatures go, Starting the day tomorrow, cooler up in the hill country because you'll be the first to get that front moving through 70s down to the south. By the afternoon, everyone will see temperatures rebound a bit better. Uh, more of us in the mid to upper 70s tomorrow afternoon and then warmer this week. But look at your morning lows, 50s to start the day Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's going to be very nice, guys. Pool season will soon be over because the pool will be too cool to get into. I can't even imagine with the heat we've been dealing with, so yeah, it's already cold. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> Summer's over. We'll be right back.
The Dallas Cowboys remain winless on the road in the Mike McCarthy era after a shootout in Seattle today. With more on what's on Instant Replay tonight, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. Why would you ever get into a shootout with Russell Wilson, who's already <laughs> thrown 14 touchdown passes in three games? And the Houston Texans are off to a terrible start by losing on the road in Pittsburgh today. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. It's second and eight. The line holds up. Dak Prescott became the first quarterback in Dallas Cowboys history to throw for over 400 yards in consecutive games, but it wasn't enough to be Russell Wilson of the Seattle Seahawks, but set a new record for the most touchdown passes thrown in the first three games of the season. Still, it comes down to the last second. Sean, do you feel like there's any panic in your team with the 0-3 start? Nah, no panic. Well said. Meantime, the Houston Texans dropped their third game in a row by being shut out in the second half by Blitzburg. Can they recover this 0-3 start and still make the playoffs? Believe it or not, they've done it before with Bill O'Brien as their head coach. We're good. <laughs> We're good. And our own Mark Mendez makes the best of big game covers tonight for taking the best hit at all new 12 stop 12 in the sub five day poll as well. And just wait until you see our play of the week. It will be one you'll never forget. It's sportsmanship at its best. And what was the biggest shocker in college football this weekend tonight? You decide instant replay is live and it's after the night beat. I'm happy to report Mark is OK. The camera, a little yeah. work needed. Mendez <laughs> earning the paycheck the hard way. Yes, he did. Thank you, Greg. We'll see you again in a little bit. We'll see you on the other side of this break. Heading to Kentucky now on your screen is some ground footage of protests in Louisville over the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. Protesters have been in the streets of Louisville all week after a grand jury decided to only charge one officer in the case. But that city certainly not the only place where protesters are demanding justice. ABC's Trevor Alt has those videos along with why the family is pushing for the grand jury's transcript to be released. Overnight cries of justice for Brianna Taylor only growing louder. What are you doing? These intense scenes unfolding across the country just days after a grand jury ruled not to charge the Louisville police officers involved in her death. Cars set ablaze in Kentucky, a flood of police arresting protesters in New York, and in California, a car driving through a crowd of counter protesters. Now in Louisville, attorneys representing Brianna's boyfriend, Kenny Walker, filing a motion asking a judge to order the release of the grand jury transcripts and all materials from the investigation, accusing State Attorney General Daniel Cameron of misleading the grand jury. I never had faith in Daniel Cameron to begin with. I knew he had already chosen to be on the wrong side of the law. The moment he wanted to, the grand jury to make the decision, Cameron said Wednesday, evidence shows the night Brianna was killed, officers knocked and announced their presence at her apartment before they entered. The officer's statements about their announcement are corroborated by an independent witness who was near in a proximity to apartment four. But according to the court filing, Walker's attorneys claim at least 11 neighbors said the officers repeatedly pounded on the door without identifying themselves before bursting into the apartment. And the witness who said the officers did identify themselves appears to have changed their story. Vice News reporting this audio of that neighbor speaking with investigators a week after Brianna's death. Did you ever hear anyone identify themselves as police? No, nobody identified itself. ABC News has not independently authenticated that audio. Vice reports it wasn't until May, two months later, that witness told investigators he heard police say, this is the cops. Trevor Alt, ABC News, Louisville, Kentucky. And the Kentucky Attorney General says he will not release the grand jury transcript because of a pending FBI investigation and because of the pending criminal trial against the officer who was charged with endangering Taylor's neighbor's life when he opened fire into the apartment. The New York Times is now reporting President Donald Trump paid just $750 in federal tax and in income taxes the year he ran for president and his first year in office. The Times says the information comes from tax return data. The report also claims he has not paid federal income taxes in 10 of the past 15 years. President Trump is the only president in modern times to not make tax returns records public. In a new news conference at the White House, President Donald Trump dismissed the report as fake and says he has paid taxes. 
Out west now to California, where a fast moving wildfire has forced homeowners in the heart of wine country to evacuate this morning. Napa County authorities say the glass fire, as it's now known, has already scorched more than a thousand acres. That's when deputies had to race through neighborhoods trying to alert people of the danger. Fire crews have been using tankers and choppers to attack the fire from the air. Uh, thick smoke could be seen for miles. Videos on social media showing a number of houses and structures burning. Around Texas now, thousands of people made it out to the first ever Big Tex Fair food drive through in Dallas. Take a look. Organizers say nearly 3,000 vehicles lined up outside the state fairgrounds, the line spanning miles. Some people waited more than two hours just to get inside, but once inside, they were able to pick up the fair food along with carnival prizes. Those in attendance say it was worth the wait. Long line, but we all want our Fletchers. You know, we got to have our Fletchers and a fried Oreo and a prize for the kiddo. I've been to the fair almost every year I've been alive. And we just had our daughter this year over the summer. So we wanted to find a way to bring her along. Anything for the fair. After the State Fair of Texas was canceled due to COVID-19, fair organizers say they wanted to give Texans a chance to keep their traditions alive. Don't know if you saw it there, but Big Tex all masked up there. Yeah, and a mask. Large mask. <laughs> I love it. Yes, worth it for the fair food, that is. Mm, Gotta get those fried Oreos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 84 degrees, it is still warm and it is very, very muggy out there, but very soon, I'm talking within like a matter of hours, we're gonna start to see a drop in our temperatures and our dew points. Near 80 up in the hill country, still 88 in Carrizo Springs, 87 in Del Rio. Look what happens overnight though. As we get past midnight, skies start to become mostly cloudy. By 3 a.m., we're still overcast and humid, but then that frontal boundary sweeps through and we'll start to see our temperatures drop. We're looking at an out the door temperature near 60 degrees here in San Antonio early tomorrow morning in the rest of the week is looking fantastic as well. Another look at that cold front and what it means for your week ahead coming up. Tim. Look forward to it, Katie. Thank you. Still to come on the night beat the benefits from a cafe aimed at healing families struggling with addiction. That's our topic for this week's What's Up South Texas. Oh, plus one of the uh, first public housing projects in San Antonio left in limbo the uh, proposed redevelopment plans and what this could mean for the people who live there. We're all awake here now. <laughs> Since she started her uh, nonprofit years ago, thousands have overcome their battles with drugs and alcohol. Terry Lopez started Serenity Star and Comfort Care, a recovery center for addicts serving Texans from all over. She's our next feature on What's Up South Texas. She tells the night team's Jaffney Gray about her personal struggles with addiction and how she and those who work with her strive to inspire others. Now sit around the kitchen table, right? feels way better than going to an office and, you know, feeling judged. Here at Comfort Cafe in San Antonio, you see many people enjoying lunch and having a good time with their friends and families. But what you may not know is that it's a recovery center helping families recover from alcohol and drug addictions together. The cafe works with Serenity Star, a recovery program in Smithsville. We tell them, if you only want to stop using, this is not the program. If you want to change, this is the program. 59-year-old Terry Lopez co-founded the nonprofit 10 years ago, growing up fatherless and with a rough upbringing. She started using and drinking as a teenager to cope. A lot of people do, um, but none of us know who's going to wind up not being able to stop it. She said, like most people, her addiction stemmed from self-hatred. If dad can't love me or stay here, why should I love me? One day, she made the decision to get sober. While doing so, she and her partner realized recovering addicts and alcoholics like them were the best at helping other recovering addicts and alcoholics. You can't tell me you don't know how to do it or you can't do it because I'm doing it. With both Serenity Star and Comfort Cafe, Terry, along with her staff, have helped thousands stay sober. 27-year-old Austin Payne is part of the staff. He became addicted to drugs after his parents divorced when he was 11. That came with, you know, legal issues, uh, homelessness, 
um, not knowing where my next meal is coming from. He went to 13 recovery centers in a seven-year period, but two years ago, he was introduced to the program he now works for. There was so much shame around everything I'd done um, and my addiction, and I got to come in here, and I was encouraged to share that with people. The program focuses on vulnerability. How you feel, where your kid is, how you're going to be different, what your purpose may be. Someone who wanted to die yesterday is now smiling and dancing and laughing. Terry's and Austin's dedication to helping families recover is inspiring for What's Up South Texas. There's always hope. It's never too late and you are enough. Love always prevails. Jaffany Gray. Oh! KSAT 12 News. Welcome back. One of the first public housing projects in the country. More than 1,200 people live there. Their future left in limbo. This week's episode of KSAT Explains takes a look at the history, the proposed redevelopment plans, and the controversy. Myra Arthur has a preview. The Alazan Apache Courts, the public housing project, has been a staple of the West Side since 1940. But the future of this housing project is now in limbo. It has been contemplated that we would demolish, and it seems like it would be the most uh, cost effective as well as the best way to modernize uh, that community. The units are made of cinder block. They're small, they're run down, and don't even have central air. The way that they're designed is antiquated. No matter how it looks from the inside or outside, it's still, it's, it it's, home. It's, it's still home. A lot of us want to stay. We don't want to be put in different sides of town, all over San Antonio, get, get dispersed across the city. Plans to build new mixed income housing being met with opposition. We don't want to ever say uh, no to newcomers. We also don't want to see our longstanding families pushed out. It's historic past, hard for some to leave. It's just something that's not, it, it, it's irreplaceable. The homeowners are not going to survive. The small businesses are not going to survive. The taxes are going to go up. The cost of living in this neighborhood is going to go up. And the people that have been here for generations, they're going to be gone because they can't afford it anymore. The history, the plans, and the controversy. KSAT explains the battle over the Alazon Apache courts. That new episode will be available for streaming on Thursday. You know what will also be available to us? <laughs> Sweaters, <laughs> pants, boots. I can't. I'm so excited. Yeah, but now you're going to have to prepare for, okay, we do fall in the morning. Yes. We do summer <laughs> yeah. in the afternoon and then back to fall. But yes. there's fall in there. That's yeah. all that matters. You just got to layer and take off, I guess. Yes, that is exactly what we're looking at this week. Mornings in the 50s, afternoons in the 80s. So a layer type situation uh, as we get into the next several days. All these changes at the hands of a front that's moving through Texas now. It's approaching San Angelo. It's got some nice cool dry air behind it and that front will be dropping down into our area tomorrow. We expect it to get to San Antonio between about four and six o'clock in the morning. So we are looking at tomorrow morning getting everyone out the door and ready for the day. Temperatures falling into the low 60s. Windy. It will be windy by the time everyone's heading out tomorrow morning. North winds 15 to 25 by the afternoon a bit warmer. Our temperatures will rebound into the mid to upper 70s and not quite as gusty. Still breezy tomorrow afternoon, but our highest wind gusts will come during the first part of the day. Looking at radar, it is very quiet out there, but we do have some storms forming along. Yes, the cold front there in far north Texas, closer to the Red River. This is northeast of Dallas, just off to the east of Sherman. There a severe thunderstorm dropping down to the southeast. So the good rain making energy with this frontal boundary is unfortunately going to stay well to our northeast for us, that means essentially no chance of rain. I think there could be a couple of little sprinkles very early tomorrow morning as this boundary gets to us, but the better chance for you to get just a little bit of rain is going to be if you're east of 35. Even then, it's really not going to be much at all. Frontal boundary will continue to drop south by 6, 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. This is south of Highway 90 and working toward the Gulf Coast. Uh, but the winds are going to kick in right away when this frontal boundary gets to you. And for some of us, that means winds will start to become gusty overnight while we're sleeping. So 
As we get into Monday, 4 o'clock, that's about when the frontal boundary is going to get to us. And look what happens here. This is refreshed within the last like 30 minutes or so. So 4 o'clock as the frontal boundary is getting in, not too gusty. But as soon as the boundary passes, look at our wind gusts, even by 7 a.m., shooting up to near 40 miles per hour. So if you still have a little bit of time tonight, and you haven't gone out to get the loose items on your patio, maybe some fall decorations or stuff like that. Um, you may want to secure them before you head to bed for the night because when those gusty winds pick in, it's likely going to toss some of your um, outdoor items around just a bit. So a look at your day tomorrow. Again, frontal boundary coming in early. We'll see our temperatures drop down to near 60 degrees and then rebound tomorrow afternoon into the mid to upper 70s. Cloudy and gusty through the first part of the day. Once we get into the afternoon, Hours, we'll start to see a little bit more sunshine. Those wind gusts will relax, but again, it'll stay pretty breezy throughout the duration of your Monday. Winds will become light as we get into Tuesday. So another look across the area again. Temperatures tomorrow, especially in the morning, are going to vary a bit depending on where you are. With that frontal boundary moving south of Highway 90 by about 7 o'clock, we're in the upper 50s in the Hill Country, near 60, low 60s, closer to San Antonio and Highway 90. Down farther to the south, you'll still be in the low 70s early tomorrow. But then as that frontal boundary washes out tomorrow afternoon, a lot of us will see our temperatures rebound into the mid to upper 70s, uh, low to mid 70s up in the hill country, becoming sunny north of Highway 90 tomorrow afternoon, holding on to a bit more cloud cover tomorrow afternoon down to the south. But everyone will clear out as we get into Tuesday. Tuesday morning is really going to be the first morning that you'll notice a little chill in the air 54 53 on Wednesday morning, staying in the 50s through Thursday morning. So again, those are the days where you'll need the jacket in the morning. But by the afternoon, short sleeves will do you just fine, guys. All right, Tim, so it's Tuesday when you can start putting up your decorations. Oh, I'm going to start tomorrow. I like this <laughs> forecast so well, I, I took the whole week You're off. You're going to be blown off of the ladder. Well, I'll try to you stay You took off the, the whole week off <laughs> for yeah. Halloween decorations? No, not just for that. I got other stuff to do. <laughs> it's for Halloween need decorations. need a break from here. We'll be right back. <laughs> Forty years after we first saw that memorable scene, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back returned to theaters, managing a fifth place finish with just $908,000. Break the Silence, the movie, going behind the personas of the chart-topping K-pop group BTS, debuted in fourth place, grossing $1 million. Oh man. Go! Audiences are still trickling in to see Unhinged, which moved up to third place, grossing just over a million dollars. What's the last thing you remember, Danny? He said we had to run. Nothing new for the New Mutants, which landed in second place for the fourth straight weekend, earning more than 1.1 million. I'm not saying I'm getting here. No. Something worse. Four straight weekends on top for Tenet. The action flick made $3.4 million for a domestic total of $41.2 million. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. The fight in Texas Aggies win their season opener, but not as big as most of us thought. And then there's the Texas Longhorns win the shootout with Texas Tech and Lubbock in overtime. Let's find out what else is on instant replay tonight with Greg Simmons. I can't, I'm like smiling. I can't help it. You know, that game went over four hours, <laughs> almost four and a half hours to decide. That was ridiculous. And don't look now, but UTSA opens their season 3-0. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of instant replay. Opens up the playbook here for Sam. Let's see what happens. Over the middle, it's caught. Touchdown. If there is one game that captured what 2020 has been like, it was UT's bizarre cumber behind overtime victory over Texas Tech and Lubbock, a game that featured two block punts, two onside kicks, and a two-point conversion to tie. It's the new normal, as they say, with a combined 119 points scored. San Antonio's Kellen Mond struggles at quarterback going 17 for 28, but the Aggies still get the win over Vandy. How did they pull that off? We will show you. With O'Hara, two-point conversion. O'Hara, pop pass, it is incomplete. And UTSA hangs on. 
And the UTSA Roadrunners have kicked off 2020 by winning their first three games of the season, making history for their head coach Jeff Trader, while losing starting quarterback Frank Harris in the second quarter. And San Antonio FC suffers just their second loss of the season in stoppage time again. Where does that leave them in the standings for the playoffs? And Jessica Hunt's final story for us at KSAT 12 is on a new craze called Pickleball. Instant replay is live, and it's next, and she's headed to the Emerald City. Yes. We'll miss her. We will. We will. But we'll get to see one more story. Yes. One more to go. All right, Greg. We'll see you in just a few minutes. Thanks. We'll be right back.